This is section 121 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain, section 121, The Galaxy, November 1870, part 2. The Galaxy, November 1870, Memoranda, by Mark Twain. A Reminiscence of the Back Settlements. Now that corpse, said the undertaker, patting the folded hands of deceased approvingly, was a brick. Every way you took him, he was a brick. He was so real accommodating, and so modest-like, and simple in his last moments. Friends wanted metallic burial case. Nothing else would do. I couldn't get it. There weren't going to be time. Anybody could see that. Corpse said, never mind. Shake him up some kind of a box. He could stretch out in comfortable. He weren't particular about the general style of it. Said he went more on room than style anyway, in a last final container. Friends wanted a silver door-plate on the coffin, signifying who he was and where he was from. Now, you know a fellow couldn't roust out such a gaily thing as that in a little country town like this. What did Corpse say? Corpse said, whitewash his old canoe and daub his address and general destination onto it with a blacking brush and a stencil plate, long with a verse from some likely hymn or other, and pint him for the tomb, and mark him C.O.D., and just let him skip along. He weren't distressed any more than you be. On the contrary, just as calm and collected as a hearse-horse, said he judged that where he was going to a body would find it considerable better to attract attention by a picturesque moral character than a natty burial-case with a swell door-plate on it. Splendid man he was. I'd rather do for a corpse like that than any I'd tackled in seven years. There's some satisfaction in bearing a man like that. You feel that what you're doing is appreciated. Lord bless you, so's he's got planted before he spiled, he was perfectly satisfied. Said his relations meant well, perfectly well, but all them preparations was bound to delay the thing, more or less, and he didn't wish to be kept laying round. You never see such a clear head as what he had, and so calm and so cool. Just a hunk of brains, that is what he was. Perfectly awful. It was a ripping distance from one end of that man's head to the other. Often and over again he's had brain fever a-raging in one place, and the rest of the pile didn't know anything about it. Didn't affect it any more than an Injun insurrection in Arizona affects the Atlantic states. Well, the relations, they wanted a big funeral. The corpse said he was down on flummery, didn't want any procession. Fill the hearse full of mourners, and get out a stern line and tow him behind. He was the most down-on style of any remains I ever struck. A beautiful, simple-minded creature. It was what he was. You can depend on that. He was just set on having things the way he wanted them, and he took a solid comfort in laying his little plans. He had me measure him and take a whole raft of directions. Then he had the minister stand up behind a long box with a tablecloth over it and read his funeral sermon, saying, Angor, Angor, at the good places, and making him scratch out every bit of brag about him and all the highfalutin. And then he made them trot out the choir so he could help them pick out the tunes for the occasion, and he got them to sing Pop Goes the Weasel, because he'd always liked that tune when he was downhearted, and solemn music made him sad. And when they sung that with tears in their eyes, because they all loved him, and his relations grieving around, he just laid there as happy as a bug, and trying to beat time and showing all over how much he enjoyed it. And presently he got worked up and excited and tried to join in, for, mind you, he was pretty proud of his abilities in the singing line. But the first time he opened his mouth and was just going to spread himself, his breath took a walk. I never see a man snuffed out so sudden. Ah, it was a great loss. It was a powerful loss to this poor little one-horse town. Well, well, well. I ain't got time to be palavering along here. Got to nail on the lid and mosey along with him. And if you'll just give me a lift, we'll skeet him into the hearse and meander along. Relations bound to have it so. Don't pay no attention to dying injunctions a minute a corpse gone. But if I had my way, if I didn't respect his last wishes and tow him behind the hearse, I'll be cussed. I consider that whatever a corpse wants done for his comfort is a little enough matter and a man hain't got no right to deceive him or take advantage of him. 
and whatever a corpse trusts me to do i'm a going to do it you know even if it's to stuff him and paint him yaller and keep him for a keepsake you hear me he cracked his whip and went lumbering away with his ancient ruin of a hearse and i continued my walk with a valuable lesson learned that a healthy and wholesome cheerfulness is not necessarily impossible to any occupation the lesson is likely to be lasting for it will take many months to obliterate the memory of the remarks and circumstances that impressed it. The Galaxy, November 1870. Memoranda by Mark Twain. A General Reply. When I was sixteen or seventeen years old, a splendid idea burst upon me, a brand new one, which had never occurred to anybody before. I would write some pieces, and take them down to the editor of the Republican, and ask him to give me his plain, unvarnished opinion of their value. Now, as old and threadbare as the idea was, it was fresh and beautiful to me, and it went flaming and crashing through my system like the genuine lightning and thunder of originality. I wrote the pieces. I wrote them with that placid confidence and that happy facility which only want of practice and absence of literary experience can give. There was not one sentence in them that cost half an hour's weighing and shaping and trimming and fixing. Indeed, it is possible that there was no one sentence whose mere wording cost even one-sixth of that time. If I remember rightly, there was not one single erasure or interlineation in all that chaste manuscript. I have since lost that large belief in my powers, and likewise that marvelous perfection of execution. I started down to the Republican office with my pocket full of manuscripts, my brain full of dreams, and a grand future opening out before me. I knew perfectly well that the editor would be ravished with my pieces. But presently, however, the particulars are of no consequence, I was only about to say that a shadowy sort of doubt just then intruded upon my exaltation. Another came, and another pretty soon a whole procession of them. And at last, when I stood before the Republican office and looked up at its tall, unsympathetic front, it seemed hardly me that could have chinned its towers ten minutes before, and was now so shrunk up and pitiful that if I dared to step on the gratings I should probably go through. At about that crisis the editor, the very man I had come to consult, came downstairs, and halted a moment to pull at his wristbands and settle his coat to its place, and he happened to notice that I was eyeing him wistfully. He asked me what I wanted. I answered, Nothing, with a boy's own meekness and shame, and dropping my eyes crept humbly round till I was fairly in the alley, and then drew a big grateful breath of relief, and picked up my heels and ran. I was satisfied. I wanted no more. It was my first attempt to get a plain, unvarnished opinion out of a literary man concerning my compositions, and it has lasted me until now. And in these latter days, whenever I receive a bundle of manuscript through the mail, with a request that I will pass judgment upon its merits, I feel like saying to the author, if you had only taken your piece to some grim and stately newspaper office, where you did not know anybody, you would not have so fine an opinion of your production as it is easy to see you have now. Every man who becomes editor of a newspaper or magazine straightway begins to receive manuscripts from literary aspirants, together with requests that he will deliver judgment upon the same. And, after complying in eight or ten instances, he finally takes refuge in a general sermon upon the subject, which he inserts in his publication, and always afterward refers such correspondence to that sermon for answer. I have at last reached this station in my literary career. I now cease to reply privately to my applicants for advice, and proceed to construct my public sermon. As all letters of the sort I am speaking of contain the very same matter, differently worded, I offer as a fair average specimen the last one I have received. Mark Twain, Esquire dear sir i am a youth just out of school and ready to start in life i have looked around but don't see anything that suits exactly is a literary life easy and profitable or is it the hard times it is generally put up for 
it must be easier than a good many if not most of the occupations and i feel drawn to launch out on it make or break sink or swim survive or perish now what are the conditions of success in literature you need not be afraid to paint the thing just as it is i can't do any worse than fail everything else offers the same when i thought of the law yes and five or six other professions i found the same thing was the case every time viz all full overrun every profession so crammed that success is rendered impossible too many hands and not enough work but i must try something and so i turn at last to literature something tells me that that is the true bent of my genius if i have any i enclose some of my pieces will you read them over and give me your candid unbiased opinion of them and now i hate to trouble you but you have been a young man yourself and what i want is for you to get me a newspaper job of writing to do you know many newspaper people and i am entirely unknown and will you make the best terms you can for me though i do not expect what might be called high wages at first of course will you candidly say what such articles as these i enclose are worth i have plenty of them if you should sell these and let me know i can send you more as good and maybe better than these an early reply etc yours truly etc i will answer you in good faith whether my remarks shall have great value or not or my suggestions be worth following are problems which i take great pleasure in leaving entirely to you for solution to begin there are several questions in your letter which only a man's life experience can eventually answer for him not another man's words i will simply skip those one literature like the ministry medicine the law and all other occupations is cramped and hindered for want of men to do the work not want of work to do when people tell you the reverse they speak that which is not true if you desire to test this you need only hunt up a first-class editor reporter business manager foreman of a shop mechanic or artist in any branch of industry and try to hire him you will find that he is already hired he is sober industrious capable and reliable and is always in demand he cannot get a day's holiday except by courtesy of his employer or his city or the great general public but if you need idlers shirkers half-instructed unambitious and comfort-seeking editors reporters lawyers doctors and mechanics apply anywhere there are millions of them to be had at the dropping of a handkerchief two no i must not and will not venture any opinion whatever as to the literary merit of your productions the public is the only critic whose judgment is worth anything at all do not take my poor word for this but reflect a moment and take your own for instance if sylvanus cobb or t s arthur had submitted their maiden manuscripts to you you would have said with tears in your eyes now please don't write any more but you see yourself how popular they are and if it had been left to you you would have said the marble fawn was tiresome and that even paradise lost lacked cheerfulness but you know they sell many wiser and better men than you pooh poohed shakespeare even as late as two centuries ago but still that old party has outlived those people no i will not sit in judgment upon your literature if i honestly and conscientiously praised it i might thus help to inflict a lingering and pitiless bore upon the public if i honestly and conscientiously condemned it i might thus rob the world of an undeveloped and unsuspected dickens or shakespeare Three i shrink from hunting up literary labor for you to do and receive pay for whenever your literary productions have proved for themselves that they have a real value you will never have to go around hunting for remunerative literary work to do you will require more hands than you have now and more brains than you probably ever will have to do even half the work that will be offered you now in order to arrive at the proof of value herein before spoken of one needs only to adopt a very simple and certainly very sure process and that is to write without pay until somebody offers pay if nobody offers pay within three years 
the candidate may look upon this circumstance with the most implicit confidence as the sign that sawing wood is what he was intended for if he has any wisdom at all then he will retire with dignity and assume his heaven-appointed vocation in the above remarks i have only offered a course of action which mr dickens and most other successful literary men had to follow but it is a course which will find no sympathy with my client perhaps the young literary aspirant is a very very curious creature he knows that if he wished to become a tinner the master smith would require him to prove the possession of a good character and would require him to promise to stay in the shop three years possibly four and would make him sweep out and bring water and build fires all the first year and let him learn to black stoves in the intervals and for these good honest services would pay him two suits of cheap clothes and his board and next year he would begin to receive instructions in the trade and a dollar a week would be added to his emoluments and two dollars would be added the third year and three the fourth and then if he had become a first-rate tinner he would get about fifteen or twenty or maybe thirty dollars a week with never a possibility of getting seventy-five while he lived if he wanted to become a mechanic of any other kind he would have to undergo this same tedious ill-paid apprenticeship if he wanted to become a lawyer or a doctor he would have fifty times worse for he would get nothing at all during his long apprenticeship and in addition would have to pay a large sum for tuition and have the privilege of boarding and clothing himself the literary aspirant knows all this and yet he has the hardihood to present himself for reception into the literary guild and ask to share its high honors and emoluments without a single twelve months apprenticeship to show an excuse for his presumption he would smile pleasantly if he were asked to make even so simple a thing as a ten-cent tin dipper without previous instruction in the art but all green and ignorant wordy pompously assertive ungrammatical and with a vague distorted knowledge of men and the world acquired in a back-country village he will serenely take up so dangerous a weapon as a pen and attack the most formidable subject that finance commerce war or politics can furnish him withal it would be laughable if it were not so sad and so pitiable the poor fellow would not intrude upon the tin shop without an apprenticeship but is willing to seize and wield with unpractised hand an instrument which is able to overthrow dynasties change religions and decree the weal or woe of nations if my correspondent will write free of charge for the newspapers of his neighborhood it will be one of the strangest things that ever happened if he does not get all the employment he can attend to on those terms and as soon as ever his writings are worth money plenty of people will hasten to offer it and by way of serious and well-meant encouragement i wish to urge upon him once more the truth that acceptable writers for the press are so scarce that book and periodical publishers are seeking them constantly and with a vigilance that never grows heedless for a moment end of section one twenty one